You do not want this fire legendary. You might think this unit is really good, but I'm gonna tell you why they're not. Today, we're ranking every single fire legendary so you can figure out who is overrated, which units will age the best, and who is truly worth your precious, precious orbs. I considered how well legendaries perform in arena, summoner duels, and ether raids, though I gave more importance to how useful they are in arena specifically, because that's the mode you're forced to use them the most. I didn't factor in arena score, because I'm more interested in what the unit can actually do, and ultimately, I'm looking for how well these legendaries will age against the meta in the potential far future. But let me know in the comments who's your favorite fire legendary and why, regardless of how good they are in the meta. I put a high emphasis on support effects because you'd rather have a unit that can do multiple things at once, and it also helps a unit age better when their combat starts to fall off. But just because a unit supports the team, it doesn't automatically make them the best. Speaking of which, in last place we have Legendary Roy. You would have to pay me just to willingly use this guy. It's actually just sad knowing he was definitely the worst fire legendary before his refine, and unfortunately, he's definitely the worst fire legendary even after it. He has distant counter, some special charging, null guard, and some damage reduction, all of which I just don't care about. And then he can give a tiny bit of support to his team, but I bet you might not have known that because his support sucks. He can give his team plus six to attack and speed, but plus six is so irrelevant nowadays, and it's such a waste of space in his skill economy when I'd rather have him do literally anything else but that. And also, he can only support the team if there's no dragon or beast units. It's not a huge deal considering most of them suck anyways, but it's just outright stupid when nearly every other unit today can support their allies just by sitting there. I personally hate restrictions on how you give out your support effects, like only giving it to a support partner or allies with a certain condition. When you have some units just giving out the most broken support in the game to literally anyone within two spaces, and their only requirement is to breathe. It's so weird that he has a restriction on such an irrelevant support, and I really cannot think of a single reason I'd run Roy when there are better infantry swords, better melee infantries, better swords in general, and definitely better omni tanks. There are nearly a hundred other infantry swords in this game that you could run instead of this Roy. And being a sword infantry is the absolute most competitive archetype to be in. So much so that even if you made this Roy the literal best you could, there are at least 10 more god swords that could do his job better right out of the box. In terms of an aging standpoint, infantry swords are the most common archetype in Fae, and they just can't stop making newer ones. There's also only so many different ways you could design a melee infantry, so from a competition and from a game design standpoint, it is the role the absolute most prone to being outclassed because of the sheer frequency of newer options. And to make things even worse, being a melee infantry is just a bad archetype to be right now. His distant counter is irrelevant when he will die to anything and he won't live long enough to counter anything at a distance. His damage reduction is becoming so irrelevant when DR piercing is so common. And I don't even care that he's effective against dragons when he's only effective at dragging the team down. He's not a good support. He's not good on enemy face, he's not good on player face, and he's definitely not a good fire legendary. But at least he can't get any worse when he is already the worst fire legendary in the entire game. Then we have yet another infantry sword, Legendary Marth. He's one of the few units that comes with both a preference special and a preference skill, when nearly every other unit comes with just one preference skill, special, or assist. You'd think that would make him amazing, and while he was pretty cool at the time, there's really no reason to run him or arguably infantry swords as a whole. If he outspeeds his opponent by 5, or they're a dragon unit, he gets follow-up denial, a guaranteed follow-up, and a sweep effect. But his speed stat is just not good, meaning his B skill is practically useless, and it will basically never activate against non-dragons that aren't slower than ketchup. He does get a lot of stats with his weapon, and it's certainly not bad but it's just not as good as this one other legendary and you'd rather have unique and more impactful effects in your weapon and on a unit, rather than just stats that start to matter less and less. And finally, he's got a 2 cooldown preference special that deals some extra damage that technically supports the team, but it only gives plus 6 stats to the team after Marth's combat, which is just an irrelevant support, and it reminds me of a certain other bad fire legendary. His support is not good, his offenses are not good, his defenses are not good, and his archetype is not good. Maybe he can be used as a dragon killer with his dragon effectiveness, but most dragons aren't even relevant in the meta. 
you probably won't even see any dragons to defeat, and I highly doubt Marth can even take out the very few dragons he actually runs into. He's the type of unit that looks amazing on paper, but he's actually really bad in practice today. And I promise you, there are definitely other infantry swords you'd much rather run instead. He cannot do anything, he will die to everything, and you definitely don't want to run Legendary Marth. Then we have Legendary Ephraim. This guy is not at all good. But he's only here because he's a melee calf, which is better than being a melee infantry. Well, uh, I don't know if better is the right word. It is less worse than being a melee infantry. He nullifies guard, gets 10 HP healing, some special charging, and a guaranteed follow-up. All of which are just meh effects at best, and outright irrelevant at worst. And he also can't survive anything because he has no damage reduction, or really any form of defenses at all. There is absolutely nothing making Ephraim uniquely useful, or even unique. He cannot do anything. He will die to everything, and you're better off just replacing his entire kit with arcanes. But even if you did, being a melee calf is just so annoying in Arena. It's such a hassle to get him and other calves around with all the trenches, and he also does nothing to support the team. So I cannot think of a single reason you'd want to run this guy. I can see the arguments for swapping Ephraim and Marth depending on what you value more and what you plan to do with him. Marth has both his preference special and his beast skill, which is more unique and usable than basically all of Ephraim's kit. But if you're going to be replacing both of their kits at max investment, then with how much better calves have gotten in the meta, with skills like Flared Sparrow and Alarm, Marth might be better in theory, but Ephraim might actually be better in practice, and that's why I put Ephraim here. But it doesn't really matter, because both of these units just suck, they're only getting worse and worse as time goes on, and I only really like Ephraim slightly more because he's a melee calf. Speaking of melee calves, we have Legendary Xander. We finally got him so many years after we got Ryoma, and as a reward for our patience, they made him one of the worst fire legendaries they've ever made. What were they cooking? Intelligent systems must have known he was bad, and so they put him in the historical worst selling time slot of the year, and his banner remains one of the worst selling banners of all time in the history of the game, even worse than Legendary Guinevere. For a long time, we hadn't gotten any good axe calves, and for some weird reason, they decided to overcompensate, because then we got so many great axe calves back to back. They tried to sell us a fourth axe calf unit in a row, and his name was Legendary Xander. He's definitely not the best axe calf now, and to be honest, he wasn't the best axe calf even on his release. Back in book 6, I definitely would have preferred to have Groom Roy or even Summer Dimitri over Xander. I can't tell if he's supposed to be designed as some mixed phase melee calf, or he's just a really underwhelming player phase calf, but it just doesn't matter when there's this one unit that's better than Xander in literally every single possible way. If you are unlucky enough to get a legendary Xander, the sad part is that he's not even good fodder, and his only saving grace is being able to give out Sea Feud just to take out this one little sister who used to rock the meta. No Xander, not that one! He gets null follow-up, some special charging, and some 7 HP healing, all of which I really don't care about, and he gets 50% damage reduction at best, which matters less and less when DR piercing is becoming so common. And it's also just depressing, knowing that if anybody needs damage reduction, it's Xander, because him and Cavs in general are just really bad defensively. And he comes with Kanto remaining plus one, meaning Xander has even worse Kanto than Ephraim. Still, I like his kit slightly more, or well, like is a strong word. The point is that he sucks slightly less than Ephraim, and that's why I put him here. Don't even touch these guys. All four of them are wasting space on your team, and they suck even if you replaced their whole kit with arcanes. These are the worst fire legendaries in the game, and it's no surprise they make their way into E tier. Then we have Legendary Hector. The only reason why he's here and not in E tier is because he's an armor, meaning he can run a save skill and he can shield your team from a single hit before he peacefully passes away. That's all. It's not a lot, and he's definitely not good. But being a large sack of potatoes is a more meaningful contribution to the team than all of these guys combined. Although you'll have to give him a save skill because instead, he comes with one of the worst preference specials in the game, a very, very awkwardly limiting special pulse to your team, which you can't just give to your allies unconditionally, you actually have to meet the tactics requirement. And it's just pathetic when in comparison, you have countless other better ways to give special cooldown support to your allies. And also, his weapon just sucks, with damage reduction that will easily be pierced, and a follow-up denial, which I just don't care about when everyone and their dog has null follow-up. Follow-up denial is probably the most useless effect in the game when everyone has offensive no follow-up, a brave attack, or both, 
And the worst part is that he's green. One of the worst colors to be as a tank when we've been surrounded by so many green nukes for literal years at this point. And this was the moment I had to ask, why would I run Legendary Hector? He's definitely not useful today, outside of the ability to just use near or far save once before he dies. He's not unique in the slightest, because you definitely don't want to run his weapon or his preference C skill. And actually, having Ostia's pulse in the C skill makes things even worse, because it's competing for the same slot as saves or assault troop if you wanted to make him a player face armor. Not that you should, I actually beg you please do not do that, and in that sense, Hector might actually be worse than Roy. But just having the ability to run a save is why I put him here, and he's most definitely not getting any better, but at least he's not getting any worse, because just like Roy, I don't think Hector can get any worse when he is already one of the worst armors in the entire game. This green armored fire legendary sucks, but at least there's no other. Everything I said about Hector also applies to legendary Edelgard, but I only put her above him because at least she's uniquely designed to player face, uh, sorta. Like she's definitely not good at all, and she's only getting worse, but at least she can hit hard uh, sometimes. But otherwise, Legendary Edelgard is one of the absolute worst design units in the game. There's a reason why nearly every armor is forced to be a save unit. Not only is it one of the best things a unit can do to contribute to the team, but it's also just so much better than literally anything else armors could possibly do. When you are an armored unit, what exactly are you trading in exchange for a lack of mobility, one of the most important aspects in all of Fire Emblem? And the answer is, uh, nothing. Nowadays, skills and units give everyone so much bulk and so many effects that it makes a world of difference more than a bit of BST ever could. And that's why player phase armors are forced to either cheat like crazy to the point they don't even move like armors, or they're not good units, just like legendary Edelgard. And why would I use her when I can literally use any of these other options that are better than her in every single way? She does get some nice things like true damage, special charging, and damage reduction. And then she gets some things that are borderline useless, like follow-up denial and a guaranteed follow-up attack. And of course, being Edelgard means you get an extra action. But what I don't understand is, why is her weapon designed for enemy face, while her preference beast skill is designed for player face? She only gets most of her effects when she's solo, which I hate with the passion of a thousand burning suns, because she moves like ketchup on a plate, and it feels like you need to move your own allies out of her way, rather than moving her away from your allies, because she just can't get around. She did get a little bit better with Guidance 4, but there's a reason why we'd much rather run Soaring Guidance instead. Having your armors be able to jump so far like that is a lot better than having them not do that at all, and it was pretty great when we only had Guidance 4, but Flyers are significantly better options both as player phase nukes and as frontliners, and using your armors to attack with Guidance 4 is just a niche novelty today that you don't even really use because it means giving up your save unit. Honestly, I'd rather have Legendary Edelgard be a save than whatever she's trying to do in her own player phase, but then you actually don't want to use her preference weapon or B skill because you would get less effects when her kit actually wants her to be solo. And at that point, she might actually be worse than Hector. The only thing unique about her is how she sucks in such a unique way. Her refined was not good, and she really would have liked a lot more than this. She doesn't support the team, and she actually hurts your own team when you gotta move everyone else away from her. She's not a good player phase armor. She's not a good enemy phase armor and she's definitely not a good fire legendary. And she will remain one of the worst fire legendaries even after her refine. Both Hector and Edelgard are not good, and you definitely don't want them, but at least they can take a single hit before they die, which is a more meaningful contribution than the absolute worst melee infantries and calves. And that's why they're going right here. Next, we have Legendary Celica. She's definitely far from one of the worst infantry mages in the game. And she's actually a somewhat decent one, but I'm not that fond of ranged infantries in general, and it's hard to recommend her when there are countless better options that can nuke better and provide better support than Celica. Her kit is actually not that bad. She gets some true damage even with AoEs, some special charging, and a times pulse effect in her weapon. But the thing that makes her stand out the most to me is her preference B skill, which is like a magical null follow-up combined with an unconditional desperation effect. While I think her preference B is pretty good, I'd argue that with the amount of power creep today, you now want preference skills that are not only unique, but they also have things that are rare or even unseen in this game, rather than effects that you can just outsource elsewhere. 
And even ignoring that, her speed stat is not that good anyways, meaning it will almost never matter if you have desperation anyways if you can't make a follow-up attack in the first place. So at that point, her B skill is just magical no follow which itself isn't even the best skill infantries want to run in their B slot. And I think she actually got worse when Firestorm Dance 3 came out, and when Magical Null Follow-Up became so much more common, since it's on Brave Soren, one of the most easily accessible and most common unit types in the game, meaning now you can easily emulate Legendary Celica with nearly anyone, including Brave Soren himself. And ultimately, she's really not that unique anymore. I can see the arguments for putting her higher if you like the fact that she feels like she's combining two B skill effects in one. But in an age where units are getting seven effects in the weapon alone, and even three more effects in the special, more and more things are getting jammed into every possible area of a kit. And it's now actually the expectation, not the exception, to have several valuable effects put into multiple parts of your kit. Nowadays, Celica is not really unique in that aspect when she only has two effects in her preference B skill, and her weapon is quite good, but nothing meta breaking. Being a mage infantry specifically is one of the most competitive archetypes in this game, and while she definitely got a great refine, she doesn't do anything to support the team, and she's only getting worse and worse as her effects are easily emulated on other units, and as they make better mage nukers and better mage infantries, you probably don't want to run Legendary Celica. Then we have Legendary Eitri. Everything I said about wanting to have preference skills that include effects that are rare or unseen in this game, instead of effects that you can get or outsource elsewhere, apply to Itri as well. Because unfortunately for her, she has a preference B skill that might have been cool at the time, but nowadays, it's just the worst Walmart brand of Brash Assault 4, which itself isn't even the best B skill you want on every ranged flyer. Even if you gave Brash Assault 4 to Itri, I kind of doubt she would live long enough to get the chance to reflect anything and you're gonna need a lot more than just 30% DR to survive these crazy monster units of today. Not to mention that her DR is only on the first attack as well, so don't even think about sending her against any brave attackers. And then her weapon is somehow even more pathetic than her B skill when it only gives her a guaranteed follow-up attack, which again, who cares when we can swim in no follow-up. And it also only gives her Kanto from turns one through four, which is just stupid. The weirdest part is that she wouldn't even really be that broken even if she came with permanent Kanto, but at least it's Kanto 2 on a ranged unit, which I actually like quite a bit in an age where most flying nukes today are only getting Kanto 1. Ultimately, the only reason Itri is up here is her ability to be a sitting duck that can run guidance support and maybe rally an ally if you're feeling a little quirky. I do value the ability to run guidance quite a bit, and that's the only reason why she's this high. I consider it to be more useful than everything Celica can do, and just like Hector and Edelgard, there's absolutely nothing that makes her good beyond Itri just being in her archetype. But if you're less fond of flyers than I am, or if you think guidance support should be valued the same as the ability to be a save, then I can see the arguments for putting her down in D tier next to Edelgard and Hector, because it doesn't matter that she has flying mobility or Kanto if she will die to anything that she initiates on, or she will die to anything that initiates on her. She cannot do anything, she will die to everything, and I definitely do not want to summon for E tree over any ranged flyer, or really, any flyer at all. I can't recommend Celica or Itri to anyone, but Celica's far from being the worst infantry mage, and Itri can run Soaring Guidance. It's really not a lot, but at least it's something, and that's why they're going into C tier. Next, we have no one. It's actually embarrassing just how bad these fire legendaries are compared to everyone else. But finally, we have gotten to units that are actually good. Beyond B tier, the rest of these units are the only fire legendaries that I would even consider using. At the bottom of A tier, we have legendary female Shez. While I still don't love ranged infantries, it's hard to say no to her when she hits as hard as she does. And in my mind, every time I look at any ranged infantry nuke, I'm comparing them to legendary female Shez. She's one of the most powerful units in the game when she has both special charging and the best effect in the game, unconditional brave on both player phase and enemy phase. And also, she's effective against basically every single unit type. Just imagine showing this to anyone back in Book 1. By this point, we already had some really strong player phase units like Legendary Veronica, but this Shez was another piece of the pie that really started to solidify the crazy player phase meta that we've been living in for years now, and she's definitely the reason why we don't have Roker Sieges anymore. Somehow, she has actually gotten even better since she came out, which is crazy just to even think about. She doesn't come with slang, which was a notable issue for her on release, but it doesn't really matter now when you can give her Rally Spectrum, or you can just give her slang yourself if you equip her with the Marth Engage Ring. And also, she's gotten even better with skills like Speed Preempt, Desperation 4, Attack Speed Pledge, and Physical Null Follow-Up. 
which itself we actually don't even want to run since she has something even better, Speed Death Tempo 4. While she was missing things like Null Follow Up and DR Piercing, I would argue she became even more valuable when it has never been easier to outsource those effects to her. And that's not even mentioning that she's blue, which helps her against a certain Jolly Three Houses save unit. The only reason why she's this low is that tanks are inevitably getting stronger and stronger, and while she's still a great nuke today, she's actually getting worse and worse as speed creep gets crazier, meaning she will only continue to struggle more to quad and nuke. And even ignoring that, they will inevitably make a stronger nuke than her anyways, which is crazy to think about when this is a unit with effectiveness against all weapon types. We have reached the point where even that is far from the most cancerous effect a unit can have. And to make things even worse, she doesn't support the team at all. Meaning even if you assume she'd instantly delete every unit she initiates on, at best, she's a ranged nuke that can move two spaces. And she's certainly a great one, but I'd rather have units that can contribute to the team in more ways than one, and just do more overall. All of the units above her have a similar, if not better, offensive presence, while also having a significantly greater supportive presence, and that's why I put her down here. Then we have Legendary Female Alir. I know it's a hot take to put her this low, but I'm trying to look at units in the long term, like really far into the future, and yet even today, she's already showing her age a bit. First, I think it'd be easier to talk about the things that are undeniably good. She has, and say it with me now, the best effect in the game, Unconditional Brave on both player phase and enemy phase. Then she gets some extra damage from her special being boosted by her own speed, which is amazing when she's one of the fastest units we've ever gotten in this game. She's definitely worthy of A tier, but other than that, I would argue she struggles defensively with the effects or lack thereof in the rest of her kit, which is a big problem for her when her best use case is as an Omni tank. She gets some damage reduction from her weapon and her special, which definitely isn't bad, but it's not enough when basically everyone nowadays comes with DR Piercing. And speaking of which, she grants herself and her support partner DR Piercing when they trigger their specials. And at the time, this was ridiculous beyond just a few niche skills, most of which were only locked to infantry by the way. There was absolutely no way for most units to pierce damage reduction, when everyone and their dog had multiple sources of DR layered on top of each other like lasagna. But now, when we have so many sources of DR piercing, whether it be from built-in new specials, weapons, preference skills, from other skills or specials you can inherit, or even just giving it to literally anyone at the start of turn, I kind of hate that Alir can only give her DR piercing support to one person at a time. For all of those reasons, I really don't like support effects that are this restrictive, like I mentioned with Roy. But as if this still wasn't bad enough, even if you assume Alir is the best Omni tank in the game, and by the way, she's not, you have to ask yourself if you even want an Omni tank in the first place. When you would rather use archetypes and roles that are more effective and more specialized, Omni tanks have fallen out of the meta. And it's really hard to be an Omni tank when it's hard just to be a normal tank because player phase nukes are so common and so broken. Let's be generous and assume she instantly deletes everyone she initiates on. The real questions I'm asking are, how good is her defense? Will she survive the crazy nukes today, even if the best far savior can't? With all this out of combat damage running around, I really don't think so. Not to mention she's a melee infantry, meaning her threat range just really isn't the best, and she suffers from everything I mentioned with both Legendary Marth and Roy. Omni tanks and melee infantries are some of the most common archetypes that can power crap, and I'd honestly rather run someone who has a bigger threat range or someone that can do more. Her only saving grace then is what she can do as a support, and even there, she's not the best. I can see the value of stacking DR, meaning you have it in both your skills and your specials, but with how restrictive Alir's support is, I see it more as a niche trick you can do, rather than something I would willingly and consistently give up an entire team slot for, the single most competitive thing in this game. In this sense, I think she'll age really poorly just like legendary male Byleth. They both gave an effect that was essential at the time, but they were valuable because they were the only way to give out such an effect, not because they were the best way. And just like legendary male Byleth, I only see her getting worse and worse as she'll probably be reduced to a bench warmer that can be pretty solid on player face, but she can't really do anything else. She's not the best Omni tank, she's not the best DR support, she's not the best offensively, and she's definitely not the best defensively. For my money, that's why legendary female Alir is the most overrated fire legendary. Both Alir and Shez are amazing units, but in an age where everyone is so broken on their player face, they're not really that unique. They're only getting worse and worse, and I'd rather run Camilla instead of Alir for DR support. I can't put them any higher than A tier. And now, we are looking at the absolute best fire legendaries in the game. To be honest, these are the only fire legendaries I want to use. And at the bottom of S tier, we have Legendary Lelina. 
I know it's crazy to put her this high, and I promise you, I originally put her in A tier at first, but the more I thought about it, I struggled to find reasons why she shouldn't be here. Her weapon gives her a guaranteed follow-up attack, 30% DR, and most importantly, slaying times pulse, and true damage even with an AoE, which by the way, she definitely will be using since she needs absolutely no help to charge one of the best specials in the game, a 2 cooldown AoE with the best layout in the game that also gives one of the best effects in the game. Kanto 1 to her and her whole team. And because of the effects in her weapon, she can keep looping and launching AoEs completely on her own, basically every single time she initiates. Not only is she completely self-sufficient, but she does a better job at granting Kanto 1 better than Ellie would ever could, and she grants Kanto even after she dies, which is actually just ridiculous. And as a support effect, I just love Kanto when I have it, and I absolutely hate Kanto when my opponent has it, because Kanto feels like a pseudo reposition or dance. It's one of the best effects in the game because it provides you key defensive or offensive positioning after you've already acted, which makes such a huge difference when a single tile is more than enough to get your buffs going or to be out of danger. And in Arena specifically, I would call Kanto almost mandatory because you can't run reposition if you want to score, and you really need some form of defensive positioning, or else your units are sitting ducks ready to get hit after they initiate. And her kit is so good when AoEs are so powerful, but they're balanced by a high cooldown, and nearly every other unit needs some external support, unless you're Legendary Lelina, when you have the best AoE layout in the game, while also having it to 2 cooldown at most. AoEs are definitely one of the best specials in the game because it feels like it disrupts the turn order of player phase and enemy phase. They're so broken for a similar reason why the pre-combat damage is also so broken, but AoEs in particular are so good because it feels like cheating when you can deal damage to multiple enemies all at once and so many units become crippled and useless when their entire kit requires them to be above 25% HP. And it feels like you've eliminated multiple threats at once when you have turned multiple enemy units into useless potato sacks with 1 HP that deals 0 damage, and they will die to literally anything, and they will die even if they attack you, because they will die on your counterattack. Even with just the Kanto and AoE thing, I would still put her above female Alir, but in my mind, what really solidifies her placement in S tier is the fact that she is basically the only unit in the game that comes with one of the most influential effects in the game, Hardy Barry, built right into her weapon. Hardy Bearing is consistently regarded as one of the craziest things they could ever put as an echo skill. It is consistently one of the most effective and sometimes only way to take out some of the best and most annoying units in the game, basically anyone with vantage or desperation. And Lelina is basically the only way to get Hardy Bearing other than running it as a seal, which you can only give to one unit at a time. They didn't even give it to her bride version. And other than some irrelevant seasonal units that should be dancing instead of attacking anyways, and an inheritable dagger that absolutely nobody uses, Lelina is the only way to have Hardy Bearing. And as they make more units with Vantage, Desperation, or as the need for Hardy Bearing becomes more frequent, I simply cannot put her any lower than this. If you're still having doubts about me putting Lelina this high, then let me ask you this. Will they make another powerful ranged nuke? Yeah, they probably will. Will they make another more powerful and bulkier Omni Tank? Yeah, they probably will. But will they make another AoE cav nuker that grants Kanto 1 that also has Hardy Bearing? I don't really know about that one. Not only is she an amazing support, but she's an amazing offensive unit, and she certainly leagues better than every other Fire Legendary. She's definitely the best AoE nuker that provides Kanto, because she's the only AoE nuker that provides Kanto. While she's facing stiff competition from this one other Red Mage cav that can actually pierce DR, and even with all of her competition and downsides, there's just no way I could put her any lower than this when she's easily one of the best Fire Legendaries in the game. But she's not the best Fire Legendary in the game. There's this one unit that not only terrorized Fire Season, but from the moment they came out, they terrorized every single mode in the game. I present to you the most broken Fire Legendary and one of the dumbest units they've ever put in this game. We have Legendary Hinoka. She shaped every single mode in her own image when she single-handedly recreated flyer lines, or what I like to call them, cav lines that move in the air with better mobility than every cav could possibly dream of. 
She has Slang, Offensive No Follow Up, and Canto 1, because why not? She's effective against flying and armored units, because why not? She does true damage even with AoEs. She debuffs nearly the entire team just for fun. She grants special charging to herself and her allies. She has a sweep effect if you are slow or green, and she grants one of the best effects in the game, charge, the equivalent to extra movement with none of the terrain downsides to herself and anyone else that can fly. Who cares about trenches, forests, or even mountains when you have charge or you're a flyer? And in this day and age, you better hope you're a flyer, because it feels like every single map in Arena and Summoner Duels is flyer favored. There is no other unit that is more freely mobile than flyers, and I don't need to explain why giving what is essentially one extra movement is so good, especially when you're giving it to a movement type that will never be hindered by anything, meaning there's absolutely nothing stopping them from hitting you with a swarm of dead eyes and flared sparrows. Throughout Book 7, flyers are slowly getting better and better with skills like Guidance 4 and Guard Bearing 4. But then Hinoka put Flyers into maximum overdrive, and Flyers ruled over Book 7 because of her. And I would argue they still rule over Fey even now, and I don't really know when they would stop. I said how I value legendaries that give support, because they end up aging the best. And it's true when she can give your entire Flyer team some of the most insane movement possible. Literally no other Fire Legendary, or arguably even legendaries in general, enable such a powerful and almost essential archetype like this. She enabled Flyer Lines and this Age of Flyers for all the same reasons why Cavs used to be so dominant. Mobility and range is simply the best asset you can have in Fire Emblem, and every role is supposed to be balanced by the fact that they have pros and cons. In fact, I would argue Flyers used to be some of the worst archetypes in the game because they didn't have anything they were particularly good at. Armors being able to save is one of the best things you can have in this game, and they used to be nearly mandatory on every team. And then compared to infantries, Flyers had really poor skill accessibility, meaning they just couldn't run good things in their kit compared to everyone else. When infantries were better offensively and defensively, and they had the same threat range, why would I run a Flyer? And then compared to Cavs, they don't reach as far as Cavs do. But with Hinoka and all of these other crazy skills making Flyer so good, it actually disrupts the meaning of each archetype. And I would argue Hinoka and every other Flyer killed the infantry archetype and it's actually why infantries have become less relevant. In fact, depending on who you ask, they killed other archetypes too. Hinoka and Flyers are so good that you would commonly see teams of nothing but Flyers in Summoner Duels, meaning you'd rather run yet another Flyer than a save unit. Let that sink in, because that's how powerful Legendary Hinoka is. She's a great debuffer, she's an amazing range nuke, she's the support so good she rebirthed an entire archetype better than anything else we had, and as the cherry on top, she's also ranged. Being an amazing offensive threat and one of the best supports in the game is the equivalent of having your cake and eating it too, especially since Roy can't do either of those things. And really, neither can any of the fire legendaries beyond S tier. Like, what even is this? It is beyond a doubt that Hinoka is not only one of the most meta-impactful fire legendaries they've ever added, but one of the most meta-impactful characters in the game. No other character enables such a powerful support while also being an amazing unit themselves, not even Lelina. And being able to not only serve multiple functions, but to do them all so well is what makes these units so good. Power creep has come to the point where it's no longer enough for you to be really good at one singular thing. And there's even cases where being the best at it just doesn't matter that much, like being the best nuker. You want and basically need units to play multiple roles and do multiple things so ubiquitously well that you are basically the only viable option or choice to run it in this game. And well, look no further than Legendary Hinoka, when she lets all of your flying units become gods. It's no surprise that she's one of the most meta-impactful units they've ever added, and she's definitely the best fire legendary in the entire game. Lelina is one of the most powerful and useful units they've ever made, while Hinoka is one of the most broken units they've ever made, and they stand alone in their own tier, and they rule over Fire Season for good reason. And it's actually just stupid that Hinoka gets even better when you use her with this one unit I talked about in my Win Legendary tier list. Did you enjoy the video? Only if you did, then drop a like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.